Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our session about Open Daylight, OpenStack, uh, and Kubernetes integration for high performance applications. Uh, my name is Nirik Kiel. I'm a product manager with Red Hat, focusing on our OpenStack platform product and specifically on networking. And here with me is Francois. Uh, hello, nice to meet you. I'm uh, Francois Le Marchand. I'm basically responsible for the uh, NAVI strategy uh, in Ericsson, which means basically OpenStack and SDN. Yeah, um, the agenda for today. Um, so Francois is going to um, briefly overview uh, why SDN and some common use cases uh, and requirements for kind of infrastructure in modern um, uh, days for SDN. And then I'm going to deep dive into the Open Daylight project. Uh, it'll be describe the project itself, the community, and the Netboot project, which is what we are using for the integration between OpenStack and Open Daylight. Uh, and we also are going to do an overview of the Ericsson and Red Hat joint NFBI offering, um, and provide you with some links for further reading. And if you want to get the slides that are publicly available, you can check out the link here or just take a picture. It's on SlideShare. It's a PDF, you can download it's PDF or just use it in your uh, browser. With that, I'm going to hand over to Francois. Thank you. So yeah, so one of the reasons we're jointly presenting Ericsson and Red Hat is because we, we are basically providing like a joint product packaging for both uh, OpenStack. Uh, our uh, OpenStack distribution is based on, on Red Hat. Uh, we are also um, integrating OSDN controller with a, a standard Red Hat uh, OSP platform. Um, but we, most important, we are jointly working together on the upstream community in, in Open Daylight. And I think most of this presentation is really focused, not so much on the product, but really on what we believe are the necessary properties and capabilities of an SDN controller uh, to provide a good like, a solution for virtualization. Um, and then on the second part, so it's a bit of re recap of basically what we have upstream, what we are doing now with ODL. Uh, in OpenStack, and then open up, you know, to new requirements, including containers and, and bare metal, and how we see this integration with, uh, with ODL. So, picture of myself. Um, that's basically the tech museum in San Jose. I guess many of you had a, a chance to, to go there, or Santa Clara. Um, I, I was very happy to see my very first router over there, uh, Cisco AGS. Um, it's being released in uh, 1986, so it's about 30 years old now. Um, and, and it was my very first day as an intern in the, in the networking at university. I really got the task to take an old, you know, AGS Plus, clean it up. It was full of dust, so you don't have to dismantle it on the parking lot. Um, and basically upgrade it with the latest and greatest uh, iOS release. At that time, it must have been like a Cisco iOS 8 or 9, something like that. Uh, because you know what? The, the top most uh, feature uh, and the cutting edge feature that we needed at that time was GRE. GRE tunneling. And that's very funny because, you know, uh, if you look at where we are today, um, I mean, what I was doing back then, you know, with Jerry is basically we had a complex campus, you know, with a lot of universities and very complex networks. And then, of course, all the labos and so on, they are their own server and they had their own private IP addressing and they did not comply with the overall like design rules. And uh, they also wanted to manage their own security of their own VPN and so on. So, you know, the solution was pretty simple, build an overlay, right? Build a Jerry tunnel between, you know, to the multiple sites of the, the same tenant which is whatever, you know, labs in the, uh, in the university. Um, and then, you know, tunnel the IP packets through that tunnel, and then you create as many VPN and overlay as you want. That was 30 years ago, right? So what we are doing now in OpenStack and cloud, well, yeah, not so different, right? We still have server, we still have application. The application runs on a VM. Uh, if there are VNF, you typically only have one application per server. So from that you know, perspective, it's not that different. And then we get an IP tunnel, which, you know, the new thing is like it could be VXLAN, but don't worry, it could also be Jerry, you know. So uh, we are not too much lost, you know, 30 years later. Um, and, and why we do that? Well, same motivations, right? I mean, make sure that uh, each of your tenants, each of your OpenStack instance can get its own secure private, you know, VPN that could work, you know, independent of the underlying infrastructure and independent of your data center fabric, but independent of the one network that will connect this, uh, this fabric or in, independent from the access layer as well. So same old solutions. Um, however, 
Not to say that nothing has changed, right? Because the networks has grown more and more complex. The requirement has grown more and more complex. Um, this is a typical service provider network. I mean, it's not a service provider presentation um, because I think most of the thing we do for service provider, and of course that's our focus market for Ericsson, that also applies fully to enterprise, right? And, uh, and especially the large enterprise. And as you grow your OpenStack deployment, get more than one instance, uh, get more than one data center location that you want to integrate more closely with your existing you know, uh, IP1 network, um, you will end up with very similar type of requirements. Um, so typical service provider network, you have your access layer, enterprise, residential, yeah, mobile is missing, but uh, uh, same, same one, then an access layer, a core layer, uh, some peering points you know, where you, you connect to internet and uh, some of the public cloud services. And you know, where they deploy data center, I mean, they of course had ITs and data center for a very long time for their IT applications. But the new thing with NFV is that um, they will add you know, additional requirements in terms of performance, in terms of redundancy, uh, in terms of the type of application, how do you onboard the application, right, on top of that, uh, that OpenStack instance. There is specific requirement that is tied to the way those applications are designed in terms of redundancy, in terms of routing requirements. Um, what we see as well is uh, those centralized data centers, they are like focused on IT, some of the first wave of virtualization, of course, for the applications. Um, but we also see pretty much all the operators have plans to create more distributed data centers uh, for NFV. And the reason they will build those more distributed data centers is something that we have done in the past for, uh, for IP as well, uh, maybe not 30 years ago, but maybe 20 or so, um, which is like, if you want to have a lot of heavy traffic and have good performance, you need to move the content close to the user, right? So it's like caching on the internet, but you want to do it, you know, ultimately at the central office, uh, where you know your connection, your uh, fiber lane, your DSL lane, um, your CMTS cable connection lens, right? And you want to inject the traffic right there because you're then you're saving a lot of capacity. You don't have to carry that traffic, you know, from the peering point across your whole network. You also get much better latency, which is quite important for new applications such as, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, where we start to see cloud rendering being possible with fiber, with 5G that are getting extreme low delays. Uh, that becomes a possibility to do cloud-based rendering of those applications, but it means you need the extra low latency, like less than one millisecond round trip, right? Between the end user and the application. So some of those applications are getting distributed, and of course, it's all kind of shade of gray in between, right? You know, you have get this very centralized data center. Some of distributed like data center could be like 10 or 20 sites, maybe it's up to thousands. Uh, that's in the plan of some operators, you know, that extreme distribution, and very complex topology occurs. So what about SDN? Why we believe SDN is, is important? Well, you need to interconnect the centralized and the distributed data center because you have a set of NFV that needs to work together. I mean, some could be the control plane or management plane, some the data plane of the same VNF that has to be distributed across the data center. Um, you have requirement to connect your physical access, you know, when if you're running an FV, it means you're getting the traffic still from a physical base station, a physical GPON node uh, that connects your, uh, your fiber lanes. And you need to get that traffic from your physical network into the, uh, into the virtualized layer. And for that, you also need this kind of first arrow, right, an FV connectivity. Um, you might host application for the enterprise customers. Um, so you will need them to provide them, you know, like guaranteed uh, access for mission critical applications. So connect the enterprise to those more centralized data centers where you have more scale. Um, and then, of course, you also, you know, want to interwork with uh, public cloud in a hybrid type of setup for the operator own application, but of course for the enterprises, right? Which could benefit from, let's say, locally hosted content by the operators, but also do that in an hybrid mode with, uh, with public cloud together. So, more complex type of network setup, a lot of those arrows, each of those arrows has basically its own set of you know, requirements. You know, like if you go to hybrid cloud, you will need this to be encrypted. If that's NFV connectivity, you will need you know, one single IP address to handle maybe 100 gig or 200 gig worth of traffic going to a single IP address. Um, so each of those lines has its own set of challenges, right? Uh, co converge and secure access and so on, end to end, you also have to deal with how you apply QoS in the, in the core network, and not just simple deep serve QoS. If you really want to get like a, a very mission critical application, you need to guarantee SLA, to guarantee minimum bandwidth, to compute the path of each and every application into the network link by link. Uh, and those type of traffic engineering application is also something that 
has been done in the IP network for a long time, but now the challenge is how do we integrate that with cloud, right? And that, that's where we are going. So what does it mean? It means you need a new platform to build uh, cloud connectivity. Uh, and that platform, SDN, as you know, needs to have all those characteristics, right? I mean, I think we really believe in the open, openness, not only open protocol, right, which is the likes of SDN, but also open source, uh, community-driven open source. We are big believers, both Red Hat and ourselves, obviously, and many more, right? Um, collaborative development is very important. API model, uh, just make sure that we define well the APIs uh, that are intent-driven and so on, because we need to create the right level of abstraction uh, at the same time, you know, make sure that we don't hide any capabilities, right? That could be helpful for the upstream layer. Um, and then evolution to DevOps, which is still a bit far away from the operators because, you know, that's kind of complex. I guess also complex for the large enterprise system and many legacy applications. But this is really a key number of not only, you know, virtualization cloud, but also SDN. So the challenge is, you know, if you look at the original set of APIs we got from OpenStack, the Neutron API, they were pretty basic, right? I mean, you can do a bit of bridging, a bit of routing, and that's pretty much it, right? ML2, ML3, and, uh, and you're done, right? Then, of course, you have more, much more advanced API when it comes to value-added services, load balancing, firewalling, and so on. But still, you know, from a routing or simple connectivity standpoint, they are very simple. Uh, I think one of the challenges of SDN is not only to have a platform that fulfills all those characteristics, but it's also that to enhance, you know, release after release, the set of capabilities we provide to the virtualized layer from very basic connectivity functions to more modern IP routing capabilities, right? And if you look at those modern IP routing capabilities, you have things like interdomain, uh, hierarchical construct in order to scale, um, all kind of topology constraints for your services, point to point, point to multipoint, multipoint to poly multipoint. Uh, being able to be policy driven in terms of, you know, routing behavior for redundancy and, and optimization. Traffic engineering, I mentioned before, make sure you can actually have a, a very advanced uh, way of mapping the packets to a specific path in your, in your network. Uh, fast reroute for, uh, you know, redundancy, very important in an FV domain. There is still those, you know, magical 50 millisecond redundancy requirement for many applications. Um, and also new technologies such as segment routing that provide a lot of flexibility. So all those things, they are not, you know, uh, integrated as of today, right? Or not in a proper way into, into, uh, into OpenStack and, uh, and the virtualization solution. So one of the things we believe is that it's very important that you build an SDN platform with very strong routing capabilities at its core, because over time, those things are coming down our way, right? As we want to make things more, you know, career grade or enterprise grade, uh, as we want to make things more deterministic, as networks complexity will continue to increase uh, by doing all kinds of hybrid connectivity and distributed models, we will need all those tools uh, to make sure that we, we, we satisfy the requirements. So practical example, um, you know, use case of routing, I mean, some of the things that we, you can do is routing in a, in a more efficient way. Uh, inside the data center, so intra data center, inside the same SDN domain, one thing is interworking well with your data center gateway, whatever like edge router you have. Uh, so you make sure that when you have a virtual IP address and you have load balancers, when you get this you know, fat pipe of 100 gig of traffic going to one single IP address, even before you make a software load balancer, you need to have hardware ECMP, right? To load share the traffic across your first stage load balancer. And in order to do that, you need to use routing, so you speak the same language than the DC gateway, and you make sure this happens, and this happens with the right, you know, like uh, uh, hashing of the flows, and with the right level of redundancy and so on. Uh, another thing that is typically done on the, on the MPLS network is that you can attach some kind of group ID, right? I mean, you can play with, uh, in MPLS VPN. It's not only that you set a blue VPN or a red VPN, but you know, one endpoint can belongs to more than one VPN at a given time. So you can create interesting applications like intranet or extranet, where you can see, you know, a red VM and the blue VM don't see each other, but they both see the purple VM that belongs to the both network at the same time. You can do things at a much more granular level. When we talk micro-segmentation, very often you assume some kind of distributed firewall and so on to, to make filtering, but you can even do better than that. You can not even do filtering. You can just make sure that you only leak the routes uh, that you need, you know, depending on the VM. And the connectivity is not is not relative to the definition of a subnet. It's not because you belong to the same subnet that you see each other. You can create all kinds of constraints around the, around the routing space. Um, there is even more, of course, interest when you go inter-DC, right? When you want to connect the different uh, 
uh, different instances of your cloud to different locations. Um, it's also quite important, I don't have it on the slide, but it's not necessarily different locations. I mean, what we see more and more is people running different instances of OpenStack um, because they may have different projects that have selected different stack or because even if you use the same stack, you will have different versions and you cannot validate all your application at the same time and migrate them overnight you know, to the, to the new version. So you end up having, even in one data center, many instances of OpenStack, right? And, and sometimes you know, one solution, one VNF, will be spread across multiple of those instances, and you want to have this automated connectivity. And one of the things that you can use routing very well is to you know, extend this VPN so that you can have a neutron subnet that is extended over more than one VIM, more than one OpenStack instance, more than one uh, location. Um, that's something you can do. And by the way, you can even do it between different vendors of SDN. So of course, you know, we invest in open daylight and uh, that's our controller of choice. Um, but you know, like every time, you no, not always have only one single solution, right? And it's very important that depending on the, uh, first, you don't necessarily only have OpenStack. We talk about Kubernetes, but there is also VMware deployment. There is also many different type of VIMs right now that still exist. And it's very important that we make sure we have a solution that is also open. And when you extend, when you do inter-DC connectivity, when you set up a DCI, it's not necessarily OpenStack specific, or it's definitely not uh, specific to one specific SDN uh, controller version. And that's one of the beauty of routing that's standardized, right, through IETF and so on. If you use the proper routing protocol east-west, you can make sure you get this interoperability between different VIM, between different SDN. The other nice property is like, uh, it scales. So, you know, we all start small with OpenStack, but eventually we go big and some are already big and are getting very big. And at some point, if you want this to scale to the scale of internet, right, you can use the same recipes, where basically, if you leverage BGP, you have a set of tools. I mean, nothing extraordinary from a technical standpoint, but it's very proven that you can build very scalable networks. Uh, you have all the tools in terms of security, retransmission, and so on to make it scale. So one example is root reflector that you can build in a hierarchical way. Uh, so that you can end up you know, with billions of endpoints and, and make it scale. Uh, Inter-AS, making sure you can connect different autonomous systems uh, for scaling, but also to apply set of policies uh, that you want to, to secure your network. Um, and most important, maybe, or finally, uh, is also, what you, you can always do that with any SDN technology or baseline neutron, right? You can do baseline neutron and then you will go to a DC gateway and then you will manually cross-connect, you know, whatever VLAN to a VPN instance and you can do the same thing, right? But then, of course, it's a bit antinomic with cloud because every time you will want to dynamically create new VNF, new tenant and, new so, and so on, you will have to change your DC gateway configuration. A proper SDN solution needs to make sure that this connectivity, this teaching, to the underlay network needs to be fully transparent, fully automated, and fully dynamic, right? And, and, and right now, you know, this is the only solution is to do routing. Why is it the only solution? Because you can make it fully dynamic, but it means that it's SDN controller to SDN controller, you set up overlay tunnels, you can make it fully dynamic, but then it means you are not be able to map to, you know, the one network in a proper way in terms of SLA and QoS and so on, because you're building an overlay network and the one network is not aware of your VPN. So that would be a problem if you do that this way. It will also be proprietary and you won't be able to interwork properly between different domains. Um, and then if you decide that you do it on the DC gateway, then you get back those two properties, but then it means uh, you have to do some very complex orchestration to make it automatic and so on. So the right choice is to actually make it use a native routing stack on the SDN layer because that avoids any kind of static configuration on the gateway and makes things very fluid. Uh, so makes things seamless between the data center, between different data center instances and the one. Uh, other things, uh, service chaining. Why is it important? It's important for operators, but what they need is not basic service chaining where you will say, okay, for one tenant, I want the traffic to go to firewall and then parental control and be done with it. They want to have it policy driven. They want this policy driven. They want to have this based on their policy server that is aware of the one network, of the subscriber, of the type of radio access technology. Uh, so this could be very dynamic, how you want to set up the service chain. Um, so you have very advanced classification that is required per subscriber or per de destination or per application. So classification is quite important and you want to do it at scale again. The same way that we started with centralized routing, then DVR, then we started with centralized firewall, then distributed firewall. Same thing for service chaining. You need to have distributed classification in the, uh, in the underlay. Load balancing, symmetric forwarding, redundancy functions, all those things are essential and they're quite advanced features that you have on top of it. Uh, routing again. 
If you look at service chaining, but you want to do it across the network, then you will have different data centers, different segments. And one of the things where you need to have a tight integration with routing again um, is you can do service chaining using the technology you want inside each of the data center segment, into, inside each of the, the, the SDN domain. Uh, you can use NSH, you can use uh, you know, BGP, you can use whatever you want. Um, but then the best practice, if you want to do this service chaining again end-to-end -end between your physical routers, between different data center instances, uh, connected back to the internet, is then to stitch you know, whatever technology you use for service chaining, stitch it at the ingress and the egress with routing. Um, that's also quite important because you have things like geo redundancy and so on. You can monitor a service chain. If you know one of the nodes is dead, you know, um, you can of course protect it different way, you know, bypassing service function, load balancing across service function. But if you want to have geo redundancy, you can say maybe a data center is dead and I just want to bypass it. What I will do, I will just remove the rot advertisement, I will change the rot metrics, and automatically I will have my, you know, a network that will redirect the traffic to the right data center instance. So, um, you know, combining those type of functionalities again is very is very important to get uh, routing capabilities. Last use case, um, that's one. So the other one, they were explained in the context of service provider, but they're completely applicable to enterprise. This one a bit, little bit less, um, but even though you know we start to see that a virtual CP type of use case is also something that could appeal the enterprise when they can you know build it by themselves, more like an overlay fashion such as SD1. And one of the things that you may want to leverage your SDN uh, uh, solution for is basically interconnect seamlessly your existing physical MPLS VPN, the traditional ones, where you can add additional functionalities and services that are virtualized. So you don't have to upgrade your router. You can still use your traditional Cisco router, physical box, and so on, your existing MPLS VPN. But you can connect it in a smart way to a data center where you will deliver all the new and advanced you know, security services, for instance, in the cloud model. You have another model that is more uh, applicable to operators, uh, likely, where you get a very dumb CP, a very thin CP, very cost efficient, like a $30 type of uh, bill of cost of hardware. But then it means you will emulate all those functions into the data center. And you will use different type of connectivity instead of layer 3 VPN, you will probably use you know, VXLAN, uh, eVPN type of connectivity, more like layer 2 tunneling uh, from the CP that is very basic, just doing bridging and the data center and then emulate all the function more centrally. And then finally, uh, SD1 is probably the one that is the most flexible where you can virtualize both on premises on the CP itself and virtualize in the cloud. And doing this, it allows a lot of interesting properties such as local turnaround of the traffic. So you can have CP to CP and local breakout, which means you're not dependent of a local cloud, but you can still combine with a, with a centralized cloud for some of the, the, the more advanced services. So, you know, connecting your sites together uh, through the cloud or connecting the site to the cloud. Um, that's also, you know, one interesting properties of the, uh, the SDN controller. So all of those things are basically things that we have implemented in Open Daylight today that are available for consumption uh, in a shippable product. And, and, and also um, the title of the presentation was about high performance, uh, which is critical again for enterprise. But if you think at, uh, sorry for service provider, but if you think at enterprise, they also have data plane intensive. Uh, type of requirement. They also use, you know, security, firewall functionalities. Uh, maybe at some point you might want to virtualize some of your storage solution and so on. In that case, if you don't run it on the, on the flat network, you will need also to get high performance. And what we can do, we can drive, you know, with ODL a very flexible way, black box router, OVS, uh, SmartNIC, uh, or solutions such as FD.io that are new data plane options uh, that are uh, introduced. Um, all those options, they all come with different southbound protocol, different uh, functionalities, and the interesting properties of Open Daylight and the reason why we invested in Open Daylight is because it's very modular. So you can build plugins for different type of services. You can model different type of services. You can configure black box, white box, open flow centric type of SDN nodes, and you can also adapt to different type of data planes. So um, th those are just examples of what you can do. And using this set of data plane, you can get very high performance a virtual data plane, very high performance physical data plane with acceleration. So coming to you know what's next, um, checking on the time, maybe I'm uh, already a bit over time. But um, so what's next? Um, yes, of course we have virtualization, um, but we still have bare metal. Uh, and bare metal is quite important. 
Why is it? Of course, you have a lot of legacy, you know, legacy appliances that you're not going to throw away and that you want to make it work. You also have the new legacy, which is ne virtual network function that you deploy, but in order to get good performance or because you didn't have time to, you know, integrate in a proper way and so on, use SRIOV. And SRIOV is not always a good thing. It depends on the, on the, on the, on the profile or the, I would say, the, um, the, the use case. Uh, SRIOV could be good in a way that you're independent from the forwarding layer and the NFVI layer. You just bypass it and go straight to the, to the hardware, which gives you best performance. But that also makes it a bad thing, because if you want to use NFVI as a clean abstraction between your VNF, between your applications and the infrastructure, you don't want to create any dependencies between your NIC card, between the way your data center gateway is configured, between what your uh, data center fabric is made of, can it do layer two, layer three, what kind of VLAN tagging and so on. You want to abstract that, right? And, and from that aspect, this is, uh, this is very bad. Um, so you have to deal with those SRIOV network function regardless, right? I mean, they are reality and ma many of the initial web of virtualization happen with SRIOV. So that's something you need to integrate and they are viewed from the NFVI layer, they are viewed like a bare metal server more or less because they go straight to the, uh, to the, to the hardware. Uh, but also, it's a lot of extreme performance that are not going to go away, right? I mean, you might see less SRIOV moving forward as we get, you know, probably new and better way of connecting the VM with high performance. Uh, you get, get rid of your legacy appliances, but there is always, you know, set of uh, functionalities, especially for the carriers, uh, that you cannot virtualize or you cannot virtualize efficiently, right? And typically the access nodes. When you have specific physical interface, radio interface, uh, GPON, and so on, specific accelerations, uh, that doesn't fit very well with generic purpose CPU yet, right? And eventually at some point, we might get there, but we might get there on different architecture than x86. And up to now, we also have to make provision for that. So bare metal is there to stay for, uh, for the legacy reason, but also for the, some of the high performance type of requirements. Uh, virtual machine. Uh, it's still the mainstream approach because it's easy to virtualize, you know, any kind of legacy applications. Um, but also it's actually pretty good in terms of data plane performance. Um, if you look at container, it's more lightweight from a memory footprint. But typically if you have only one, you know, one VNF is more like a single VNF running on multiple servers, which means you only have one VM per server. So, you know, the memory footprint is, does not really, you know, make any difference. And since those applications are designed in a cluster mode, the boot up time doesn't make any difference either. Right? So those are things that you know, VM are there to stay as well for quite some time. Uh, and then finally, of course, containers are playing a bigger and, and bigger role in, uh, already in the um, uh, public cloud, mostly. Uh, applications is getting there in the enterprise. A lot of traction in the service provider market. Um, there is also application that actually benefit already today from containers. I mean, applications that are not multi-tenant natively. So we use container for that. Um, and that's where you get the best fit. So. Um, you have all three, and all three will cohabit, coexist for quite some time. So if you look at your data center, now you have the hardware layer. Uh, typically, you know, a bunch of switches with a more or less SDN-driven fabric. I think most of the, you know, hardware vendors are coming with one way to make this fabric dynamic, or to, that it can auto-discover itself, auto-configure itself. It has its own tools in terms of analytics and management and so on. Um, the, we just talked for a long time about this open stack layer and virtualization, and then now you get like container um, orchestration uh, solutions such as Kubernetes and a couple of others. Uh, and each of those solutions, they come with their own networking solution, right? So now what you end up with is like a number of networking solutions in open stack, many different SDN controllers, more or less open. Uh, you get new things, you know, like Oven, uh, Dragonflow, and so on. So even new initiatives that are doing more or less like an SDN approach. And now with containers, you get things like Calico and Flannel and uh, yet, you know, another set of services. So it's a good thing. Diversity and creativity is a good thing. But of course, you know, it creates some uh, practical issues uh, for, uh, for customers because when you want to run an application that mix and match bare metal VMs and containers, because some of the applications are pretty complex, you have the management, you have the data plane, you have the security layer and so on, and all of this is one application that is many VM, uh, many containerized applications. From an end user perspective, you get performance impact, running layers of you know, tunneling over layers of tunnelings, right? Um, you can also, you know, maybe you can accelerate, I was mentioning before SmartNIC, you can accelerate your NFVI, you can accelerate your uh, OpenStack uh, networking, but then if you run another overlay, uh, software overlay on top of it, then you lose this benefit of acceleration, you will break things like TCP offload and so on. So you need to make sure that you get, you know, best performance uh, 
um, a, a nice and easy way of provisioning the network and visualizing the network and avoid this kind of loose service integration. Uh, also, from the administrative standpoint, uh, correlation troubleshooting is quite important. Um, Internal working connectivity burden, that's you know, when you have to manually connect each of those layers together, pool of IP address, and what you use on DC gateway, what you use on the container layer, create your OpenStack network. And then you have to learn and you know, multiple, uh, multiple connectivity solution, multiple SDN layers, right? So um, what is a potential solution to that? I mean, we see two solutions. And again, we believe OpenDelight is a, is a, is a great platform because of the flexibility of the platform. Um, that you can basically choose simplest way one single SDN controller that will serve at the same time different you know, uh, layers that will configure your underlay and overlay and manage your physical switches and routers that will provide virtualization to your OpenStack layer and that will provide connectivity to your container and Kubernetes layer, right? Uh, another approach would be to say as many OpenStack instances or sorry, as many SDN instances as you have layers, but then it means um, if you need to do that, then when you provision a service at the different layers, you need to provision the service with the same model at the different layers. And you need those layers to talk to each other so you don't have this manual you know, operations happening. So uh, in order to do that, uh, we also believe that OpenLight is the right approach because then you can normalize the API and it's all young driven. So, and it's also you know, compatible with, now we have a CNI plugin, I'm coming to that uh, natively to, uh, to Kubernetes. We have, of course, a Neutron implementa uh, implementation. We are pluggable into new things that are coming in OpenStack, such as Gluon and other options. So the idea is to keep the northbound API very open, but to have, ultimately, the same way to represent the connectivity between the different layers, between a physical layer, virtualized layer, and containers, to have the same way to express network connectivity, security, and so on. Um, so that will take a longer time, you know, because in order to do service chaining using routing and so on, if you use that as an east-west protocol, it takes a longer time. What is probably going to happen is some kind of hybrid between those. You will get a single controller that can do underlay and overlay, that can do overlay and containers, uh, but maybe multiple instances of those, and those instances will collaborate again through uh, those east-west protocols. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, two options, again, you know, if you look at containers, I mean, one is uh, Magnum, uh, which is basically Magnum plus Courier. You basically run your uh, container instance, uh, but you use the Neutron layer in order to integrate with the, um, uh, with the same networking solution than the, than the VMs. And that's probably the simpler and most efficient solution if you run OpenStack and you also want to run you know, container solutions together. Um, you will be able to use the same backend and that's more or less transparent, right? Um, so that is a, a very practical option that, uh, that we have. However, the impact of doing that is also in terms of performance, right? When you talk about containers and depending on the application, if you're really you're into one of those applications and you need to fire up you know, tens of thousands of containers per second in a very intensive way, uh, using a neutron backend maybe today is not optimized for that, right? Uh, there might be other like, uh, container-specific functionalities, all the layer four load balancing and so on, that are integrated to Courier, you know, using uh, LBAS plugin on the, on the backend. Um, but there might be you know, new and more advanced capabilities you may want to do natively on the container layer. So the other option, and both are compatible more or less, is to get this native CNI plugin uh, for OpenDelight. And we started an upstream project in ODL uh, that is focusing on providing that CNI plugin capability. Uh, and as you see, this, uh, this uh, plugin capabilities also has to work with the data plane that will have to satisfy two things. First is that containers, you want to use the NFVI rules to do service chaining, VPN, load balancing, uh, uh, analytics, whatever. But you want this layer also to be able to support uh, any of the, the native kernel services, kernel networking services, such as IP tables for security and so on, that the container might request. And you need to make both at the same time. And if you use an OVS DPDK, then you're bypassing the kernel and you're not applying everything. So there is a bit of complexity where we need to integrate really these kernel layer services together with, uh, with DPDK. There is also, if you want to run your VNF over containers, and if it's a data plane VNF, then you need DPDK. Or it's, you know, uh, it's one of the challenges also to integrate DPDK. So this is coming. Uh, there is some of the early version of DPDK support for, uh, for containers. Um, that's some of the challenges that, uh, that we are solving right now in the data plane perspective. But the great news is that once you do that with, for instance, OVS or some of the uh, mainstream data plane, then you can integrate it in a seamless way between your uh, OpenStack and virtualized domain and the container side. 
Um, bare metal, uh, that's another challenge. And when I say bare metal, there is a way to integrate, you know, appliance, storage, and so on in the same overlay than, uh, than your virtual service. Why you want to do storage on the same overlay? For instance, if you want to distribute, you know, some of the storage capabilities that a remote VNF can access some of your storage that is more centrally located, you want to have this go through a VPN and so on, will simplify a lot of things. Having the same analytics tools from a network behavior, having the same cross tools, and so on. We are talking about cross before. Now I'm talking cross at the networking layer. Make sure you, you tag the packet with the right DSCB and so on and make, put it into the right queue, right? Um, so there is interest in you know, uh, making those work in the same overlay. And it means basically the SDN controller can program rules into the overlay switch. But if you get SRIOV or bare metal appliance, you have to configure the top of the rack switch. And that's where it becomes more complex because you have some top of the rack switch you can program with open flow, some with OVSDB, some are more like IP routers. You can only talk netcon for EVPN or uh, those type of routing protocols to them. So um, this is where, again, the modularity of open daylight is helping a lot because we can adapt to different type of switching fabric. And we can make sure we program the TOR switch to connect the appliances to the, to the overlay, but we can also bring up the DC fabric, right? And that's a natural evolution of ODL is you know, moving forward to use it also as an automation for the fabric. And that has a lot of benefit also to synchronize the different layers and give you like a, a, a complete and synchronized view of the overlay and underlay. You know, correlation of what happens on the overlay, where the, the traffic between two VM is mapped on which link and do like all the analytics and so on on top of it. Okay, so that was the, the last slide on the, you know, the new things coming and then leaving now to, to near to come to the actual project. Thank you. Thanks, Francois. Okay, um, so I'm well aware of the fact that I'm standing here between you and lunch, so I'll do it quickly. Um, so Open Daylight, in, in a nutshell, it's basically uh, this cool SDN platform that you can uh, build. Um, it's highly modular, extensible, and we think is the key benefit of Open Daylight because, as you just saw, we are talking about very complex use cases and nobody here knows really what's the next thing here, what's the next protocol is and so on. And we want this to be really a kind of generic platform that can adjust um, as you go. And um, this is very like a typical picture of the architecture. Uh, we're talking about kind of the controller platform in the middle and then it's really pluggable again, both on the southbound side. So different protocols and interfaces, you can talk to the virtual switches, physical fabric and so on but also on the uh, northbound side so, side, so you can talk to different orchestration agents like OpenStack, Kubernetes, and so on. Um, and um, the beauty of Open Daylight is like uh, on, on the core, there's this service and plugins, there is the runtime, the model-driven API, the data store, which are really common as a base platform. And then basically you can write different type of applications on top of that. And we can cover um, diverse use cases for edge services, for IP routing, for optical transport, for physical fabric management, for overlay management, and so on. And this is really the benefit of ODL. Um, in terms of OpenStack integration, we are primarily talking about one project in ODL called NetVirt, uh, which is uh, basically the, the technology we are using to integrate between OpenStack and Open Daylight uh, via Neutron. Um, some key fundamental facts about this integration is that Neutron is still where you define the networking API, so we are not replacing Neutron, right? Neutron is still the de facto API on the infrastructure, but we are just implementing Neutron API as, as, a, as a backend with Open Daylight, um, which is really important uh, going forward because we want to standardize on Neutron as an API and basically not replace it. Um, and right here, Red Hat and Ericsson, one thing I wanted to highlight is something we did in the last upstream uh, release, Boron, in Open Daylight, which is basically integrate the NetVirt project with another project called VPN Service, which uh, was a different one. And this really shows the um, convergence in the upstream community around NetVirt as kind of the major way of integrating OpenStack and Open Daylight. Uh, which is, again, really important because we bring all these use cases, all this know-how from Ericsson and others in the community into the NetVirt project um, and um, getting NetVirt more feature-rich and robust. Um, so NetVirt is basically an application developed on top of Open, of open Daylight. Uh, we have pretty powerful implementation for L2, L3, access list, NAT, DHCP, IPv6, and so on. Uh, and the idea is to configure and manage the overlay network. So basically everything that Neutron provides today, 
but also top of rec switches, uh, currently using the L2 gateway extension, the o using OVSDB, uh, and obviously Tenant Networks for OpenStack. It uses Netcon Fen Yang um, uh, to model the topology. That's a key uh, kind of architecture piece of ODL, but uh, it's really modular and extensible. So currently we're using OpenFlow and OVSDB in NetVirt, but we are looking into um, stuff like Netcon, FGP, and other southbound interfaces to manage uh, new southbound pieces as well. Um, so Francois mentioned the CNI plugin for Kubernetes. Uh, we are also working on VPP, uh, which is part of the FDIO integration. So this shows the kind of how powerful the platform is because we don't need to kind of reinvent everything, add new agent, new stuff. We can just reuse the platform, add more plugins, and, and integrate into new systems and technologies. Um, just really quick about Red Hat and, and, and Ericsson. So basically what we are doing is uh, we are providing together, again, Red Hat and Ericsson, we are providing, providing a converged NFVI infrastructure. Um, we are working on different tracks, NFVI, SDN, software-defined infrastructure and containers, and basically aligning what we are doing in terms of upstream initiatives and, and product. Um, maybe Francois, you can just uh, quickly describe how you are certifying the, the, the platform. Yeah, th just very quickly. Um uh, on, on this slide, you see what I described, you know, our uh, joint solution with uh, uh, the open daylight based uh, controller. Uh, but we are also, you know, selling it, and I think that's one of the ways we are bringing the technology to the market as a, as a certified solution, uh, which is, you know, a, a turnkey solution that you can use, you know, with all Ericsson and Red Hat components pre-certified, including the Ericsson VNF, that also could be consumed in a modular way. So you can pick pick and choose, you know, based of read, and it's all obviously open, and all based on an open source upstream type of model. Um, and last but not least, uh, for further reading, you can check out the link here about the Netflix project and some product documentation. And uh, we are running out of time. Take, take pictures, sorry. We are running out of time, but uh, maybe we can take like two questions. Uh, there are two mics here, and I have this one as well. Questions? Or comments, feedback? <laughs> what did we forget? Is there a link to the project after? Uh, sure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.